Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me introduce Dr. Karubian, even though he doesn't need an introduction from many of you, I'm sure. Um, Dr. Karubian is an associate professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Tulane and a founding member of FCAT, an Ecuadorian NGO. After completing his work at the University of Chicago, Jordan lived in Ecuador for five years where he developed a successful model for community-engaged participatory research. Um, and his efforts have been recognized and supported by the Fulbright Fellowship Program, the Ernest A. Linton Award for the Scholarship of Engagement for Early Career Faculty, and the Excellence in Tropical Biology and Conservation Award from the Association of, for Tropical Biology and Conservation. His work in Ecuador has helped to establish a, a reserve for endangered species and provide significant economic and capacity opportunities for locals, um, as well as serving, serve to advance scholarship and provide training for Tulane undergraduate and graduate students. Jordan held the Kailin and Brad Beers Professorship in Social Entrepreneurship at the Taylor Center from 2012 to 2018. And he's currently the inaugural scholar in residence at CPS, where he started in August of this year. Um, in this role, he's furthering his community engaged research while also supporting the Tulane scholarly community through events such as this one. So without further ado, let me pass it over to Jordan. Um, well, thanks, Miriam, and, and thanks to all of you for um, making the time to participate in this workshop. It's, it's a small enough group that, you know, I think we can really try to gear it to address your specific needs and interests. Um, so maybe I'll <clears throat> start by giving a, a brief overview of um, what what I had thought about, you know, talking about and focusing on, and then I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys about, you know, if that fits and if there's things that you would, you would prefer to talk about um, either additionally or instead of that. So I thought I would give a little bit more introduction to myself and my approach to um, community engaged research. And then I talked with Miriam about um, potentially via Jamboard, providing an opportunity for people to weigh in about, you know, what sort of themes they would like to hear about. Um, and the two main things that I had thought about talking about was one sort of a, a general strategy for integrating scholarship and community engaged research in grant writing. I think that, um, anybody who's in academia and particularly those who um, are on tenure track positions really struggle with this apparent tension between, you know, trying to engage with communities and have a positive societal impact through the work that you do. And at the same time have that, you know, ideally contribute to and enhance your scholarship rather than, um, rather than detract from it. So I thought that that's one topic that we could focus on in, in broad stroke terms and in, in particularly in the context of grant writing. And then the other one is talking a little bit more about the mechanics of grant writing and the sources that one can apply from or one can apply to, I guess I would say. Um, so I think Miriam, let me see, I got to open up my chats here. Miriam, you were saying that it's a small enough group that maybe folks can introduce themselves as well. Yeah, so maybe. So maybe a good way to start is for is to just kind of um, go around the group. I think we can, we'll play the game where I'll, I'll suggest somebody that could start and then whoever gives, you know, has something to say, then can, can talk, can mention the next person um, so that we can transition through. Maybe people can just kind of introduce themselves briefly, you know, where you're at in your career stage, what school and department you're in, what your position is in, and you know, what some of the things are that brought you to um, this workshop and what you hope to get out of it. So, um, and I will start with, let's see, I'll go with Amanda. Hello, good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. Um, my name is Amanda Buberger. I've been with uh, Tulane University since an undergrad as a student with Paul 
who was one of my favorite professors, really enjoyed his brain and behavior class back in the 90s. Um, I took on community engaged research partnerships as part of my portfolio with the Center for Public Service back in 2000, I think it was 12, after some other people had been um, you know, managing this sort of annual call for proposals. And now this cycle, Miriam and I will both be involved in this process, Miriam with the sort of faculty led approach and uh, myself with the community uh, led approach to community engaged research. Um, I've been supporting partnerships, community engaged partnerships for the past 20 years through Tulane. And it's been an absolute joy to really listen to community partners uh, about their needs and their approaches and their assets and really work with them um, to see research and engagement through fruition. Um, I'm really excited to learn from Jordan today because I've read through his proposals and I've read through some of his work and I know he really puts the community at the center of his work and I, I truly um, respect that and believe that that's the approach that we all need to be working from. And I will pass um, the next introduction over to Paul. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the shout out, Amanda, of course. That was, that was fun. I recall, I recall those days. Um, I'm, I'm somebody who has become increasingly interested in community engaged research. Uh, this started with work that I began many years ago with a local organization, The Roots of Music. And my research, I'm, I'm a psychologist, uh, behavioral neuroscientist, and I'm interested in how music and musical experience, ah, sorry about that, um, musical experience uh, shapes brain and cognition. And so we have a research project with Roots of Music um, to study how this music-based mentoring uh, changes these kids' lives. Um, I'm very interested in helping to support community organizations. Uh, I'm involved with the Mellon program as a uh, faculty fellow and also uh, one of the Taylor uh, professors in social entrepreneurship. So I'm, I'm really excited to be, you know, anything to do with CPS I love. I'm always engaged and uh, love the people who participate in this community. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today to learn uh, what everyone has to say. And oh, I'm passing it to, uh, 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 I guess, uh, Ace below me there. Good morning. Um, there's no one around, so I'm going to take this off so that you can hear me better. Um, I am a new, I just started as a master's student at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine this semester. Uh, I'm actually applying to move into the MS, PH, and biostatistics starting in the spring. And I'm here because I've joined Dr. Karubian's lab this semester, and I'm broadly interested in evolution and biology, evolution and ecology. But I've also been really curious about how we can use um, agricultural techniques to apply it to disease management and uh, how diseases are going to be changing uh, across the tropics over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I think I have a lot to learn from this. And I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Michaels. Thanks, Ace. Um, I am, a, I guess, a new faculty in the Department of Tropical Medicine, so I'm at the School of Public Health, um, but I teach primarily undergraduate public health classes and introductory um, graduate classes for the school. Um, so I, my, I'm sort of a clinical assistant professor, which is sort of the equivalent of professor of practice. And so I have worked at the state of Louisiana, the health department, and more recently at the city of New Orleans. Um, so I kind of transitioned into a service learning class really early on. I thought that was a way to still do um, community-based research projects. Um, my, my 
interests and background is in vector-borne diseases, um, particularly those spread by mosquitoes. Um, and so I'm working with um, the Urban Conservancy and the Umbrella Program about their water management um, programs to reduce localized flooding and high-risk communities. And so I'm kind of looking into, it, even though my position is primarily teaching, I still want to do um, meaningful um, engaging research primarily with undergrads and looking for opportunities to do that. So, um, and I will pass it to um, Rivanda. Oh, but we can't hear you, unfortunately. I, muted, uh, I don't know if she's muted, but we can't hear her. No, sometimes if you go under the mute and make sure that same as system is selected. You, you press on the arrow by mute and it rolls out a menu. And you select same as system. Okay, you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. I, I think I shared a little bit. I have been having some problems with Zoom. I think Zoom is like tired of me doing all this extra work, but it's okay. But it's such a pleasure to meet you all. I am so excited to be a part of this workshop and to um, be amongst colleagues. Um, I've been with Tulane since 2001 as a um, um, graduate, first with the School of Social Work, um, received my MSW, and then more so recently um, with my master's in public health in 2020. And um, just to, been with the university for six years, I've had the pleasure of working with the Prevention Research Center, the Mary Amelia Women's Center, and then more so recently, I transitioned to the School of Medicine, the Neurology Department, and so excited to be leading um, a lot of the community engagement efforts there. So um, just in my spare time, I'm a community organizer, um, and also do a lot of um, collaborating throughout the city of New Orleans with different partnerships and organizations so just looking for the opportunity um, to learn a little bit more and then possibly collaborating with some of you all to do community engaged research. So thank you. And I will pass it along to, who do I have? I'm sorry. Is it Mary? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry if there's a lot of background noise on the um, so my name is Mary Goldman. I apologize for the mask. Um, I am a visiting assistant professor in the English department and um, my kind of dissertation research was in, um, had kind of a community engagement component. And this is just my, I guess my third semester at Tulane and I currently teach writing. So my PhD is in English, but more specifically in writing studies. And kind of my, I guess my long-term, one of my long-term goals, and I'm still really in the planning phases and the idea phases, I, I really want to develop a mobile community writing center, some, like a, some kind of like mobile, I don't know, center that can like go to places where people need communication and writing support um, so they don't have to come to the university to do that. Um, so that's kind of my long-term vision and um, kind of more immediately, I'm teaching uh, a group of sophomore honor students this semester and we're currently working on grant writing. So some of this is just to kind of hone my own skills. So anyway, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Um, and let's see, I don't, who is left? Uh, Mary, I'm gonna butcher your name, uh, Marjorie? Yes, Marjorie. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm new with uh, the Brinson Family Health and Healing Center. I'm the bilingual um, wellness program coordinator through AmeriCorps VISTA. Um, and I'm going to be working on um, capacity building and program expansion, eventually do grant writing. So I'm here to kind of learn those skills and um, yeah, just to get ready for when I'm doing that kind of stuff. And I'll pass it on to is it Aya? Hello, it's uh, AJ. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I I'm I was late, uh, so I missed. Uh, I assume we're just introducing ourselves. Is that? Yeah, just a brief introduction. Glad you could join us. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a, a PhD student in um, 
the CCC program, City, Culture, and Community. Um, so specifically affiliated with the sociology department. Um, I'm also a participant in the, um, a first year participant in the Mellon Fellowship for Community Engaged Scholarship. Um, and that's how I heard about this workshop. And that's why I'm here. Um, and just so you know, I'm sorry, I might keep my video off. Um, I'm actually also in the middle of a, uh, an exam, but really wanted to to kind of like listen in. Um, so I'll kind of have this in the in the background, if that's okay. So that's much. dedication. And I think we have Aye, uh, who didn't go. I'm not sure how that's, I'm pronouncing your name right. You're, mu you're muted. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, so my name is Ai. Um, hi, um, I'm the PhD student um, in the Global Environmental Health uh, Science Department. Um, I currently work on the study um, dealing with the uh, fully recovered uh, COVID-19 patients. We try to study on the neuropsychological uh, effects on um, the recovered patients and, and basically just try to come to the conclusion and maybe suggest for the future recommendation for the medical um, aspect of it. Uh, and this is in the collaboration with the School of Medicine. However, I joined this um, seminar based on my other uh, project. I'm also the executive director of the Taylor Foundation for Arts, for the Arts and Science. Um, we are trying to uh, create an intervention program dealing with the PTSD uh, population. Um, the target group is the veterans. Um, basically, we will uh, incorporate the um, arts, uh, arts activities such as martial arts, uh, ballet, classical music uh, to be part of the intervention process as well as the PTSD therapy session to kind of keep uh, track of their uh, development. So I would like to hear what uh, everyone has to uh, say or suggest in terms of uh, grant opportunity or sources, or if you would have any uh, input uh, on anything, I would be more than welcome to hear. Thank you. Okay, great. I think that brings us full circle. Um, so, well, it's clearly a diverse group of, of people, um, both in terms of interests and specialties and, and positions and, and career stage. So I think we'll, you know, I'll try to, to make it as, as, as meaningful as possible. And I really encourage you guys to please be um, proactive about asking, you know, if, if there's things that are of interest to you that we're not specifically addressing, please be proactive. About, um, about letting us know. So <clears throat> it seems to me that most of you have um, already sort of have community engaged projects that, in, that are up and running in most cases. We could spend a little bit of time talking about developing community engaged projects and what's, what in my experience has been um, you know, the predictors of success in that because over the course of my career, I've had some, um, you know, some in tries to do that that have not worked out that well for me that haven't ended up you know, failing or at least not being successful in the way that I had imagined and other ones that have been more successful. So um, maybe I'll just take a couple minutes to talk about my own experiences with community engaged research in particular and then we can, and then we can start to focus in on the grant writing a little bit more. Um, so, when I was getting my PhD, you know, I, I went to a, I got my PhD from University of Chicago, which was very much sort of a ivory tower type of institution, and I was doing research that I found to be really interesting intellectually, but I was really frustrated by not being able to have a real world impact. And when I finished my PhD. I would, I would have bet, I would have bet the farm that I was not going to become a professor, I would, that I was going to transition out of academia into more applied type of work. Um, 
But, you know, sort of as a bridge, I ended up taking this position down in Ecuador, which over time, in a very organic kind of way, evolved into what, in, in many regards, is a successful um, community engaged research program. And I think that the two real hallmarks for me as, a, as an academic that have been successful, that have contributed to that success, one is, which many of you that, that work in this sphere already are, are gonna know, but is that, um, you know, identifying uh, and empowering members of the community that you're working in and with is, is fundamental to any successful community engaged research effort. I think it's, it doesn't work very well when you sort of come from the outside and, and don't have strong allies within the community that really are the people that you're empowering. So fundamental to my efforts, and, and really in many ways, it's, it's just good fortune that brought me in contact early on with people um, from the community where I work with in Ecuador that you know were well respected and well regarded within their own communities and that really um you know sh i shared their vision of what needs to happen in those communities to have positive change and you know i've really seen my mission as investing those people with the skills and the power and the resources that they need to move forward on it. and that's been absolutely fundamental um, so where I work in Ecuador is a, you know, remote, it's a, it's a, it's a rural landscape that, you know, 50 years ago was almost all rainforest. And it happens to be um, exceptionally rich in terms of biodiversity. So, you know, there's more species there than almost anywhere in the world. And many of those species are found there and nowhere else, but Ecuador, is also a developing country with you know the highest population density in, in South America. And, um, and over the course of the last 50 years or so, you know, mainly colonists have come in from other parts of Ecuador and cut down forests, mainly to establish small farms. And as a result, the habitat is just really disappearing. And that's also causing you know, social and economic issues for the people that work there. So you know, I've been able to work with local residents to um, to really empower them as as people who can conduct research into what's happening there and what are the effects of it, and also um, to empower them as as advocates for um, for different types of trajectories and, and possibilities. So, you know, the people that I work with, I've, I've been able to secure funding from grants primarily that has allowed um, these local residents to get full-time salaries and to get a lot of sort of training and capacity building to empower them to, you know, to fulfill these roles. And, I mean, just briefly, it's been, you know, there's been some things that we've tried that definitely haven't worked. And there's been other things that have been pretty successful. Um, and where we are right now, just so you know, is, is, yeah, is that, um, you know, we started, I started working there about 15 or 20 years ago, about 18 years ago. And about 10 years ago, we took the step of actually forming an Ecuadorian NGO. It's recognized legally within Ecuador as a non-for-profit um, called FCAT. And, um, you know, more recently, we've used the information that these residents have gathered to justify um, getting additional funding to create a reserve um, with a station that functions as both a source of more sustainable income for this NGO, because people you know, pay to go down there and do research or take courses or whatever, but also as a center, as sort of a community center for you know, a whole different range of types of community events that we put on there. Um, obviously that's been um, hamstrung by, um, by COVID, but that's the vision of what we have. So you know, that in a, in a thumbnail sketch is, is the strongest um, 
I've also been involved, you know, I, I, when I moved to Tulane about 10 years ago and started as a faculty member here, it was right after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened. And I started research into brown pelicans, um, which is, you know, the, uh, the state bird of Louisiana, which is also, it was, it was actually extirpated in the state of Louisiana um, in the 60s because of DDT. So it was completely, the state bird was completely erased from the state and not present here, but then it was reintroduced um, subsequently from populations from Florida and the population started to grow again. It actually just got delisted from the Endangered Species Act when the, when the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened. So I started doing research in that. I tried to do a community engaged piece around that. It ended up not working out that well for me. And I ended up abandoning that as a as a project. Um, and then more recently, um, I've started doing work on mockingbirds and and lizards. Even more recently, here in the city of New Orleans, and how they're affected by exposure to lead. So that's a theme that intersects with some of you who work in in, in more sort of public health um, aspects. And um, I'm, you know, starting to work in a, in a, starting to develop community engaged perspectives on that and angles on that in the context of working here in, in, in New Orleans. Um, but that's, that's something that's moving along much more slowly and is in much more sort of incipient stages. So I feel like I've had exposure, excuse me, one second. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've had exposure to, you know, trying things in a bunch of different contexts and some things have worked better than others, but, um, you know, it gives me some appreciation for the range of, of projects and challenges that you guys may be facing. Um, so I'd like to just say one, a, a couple of more quick things, and then we'll start talking about grants per se. So one other quick thing that I wanted to say is that a lot of you are not on, on tenure track positions, um, but for those of you who are, who are or who are thinking about it, I think that you know, one thing that has emerged for me that's been notable for me has been finding a way to, to, to merge and, and really create synergies between the engagement and the scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a major challenge that's really fundamental to promoting um, community engaged research. It's, you know, I think it's, it's something that acts as a major deterrent for many faculty members, you know, especially pre-tenure faculty members, but, but also those that are post-tenure in terms of this perception that every hour that they spend doing community engagement is an hour that's taken away from work that they could have done publishing a paper or you know, advancing in terms of the metrics that matter for the promotion and tenure committee. And in my own case, you know, I've been able to, to develop a model where really the, the one hand feeds the other. And it's ended up putting me in a, in a, I think in a very strong position in terms of advancing my own scholarly career um, within, within Tulane. So I don't know how much interest there is in talking about that. That's something if people want to, we can circle back around to and, and unpack a little bit. But I, it's something that, um, you know, for me is, has been really fundamental to the, to the success that I've had in community engaged research is feeling like there's not that trade off that exists. So if it's useful, we can talk about ways to conceptualize, you know, that merger and synergy between um, scholarship and community engagement and the ways to work that into grant proposals. Um, so that's one, you know, that's one piece that I wanted to mention. And then the other piece that I wanted to mention is that um, the project that we have in Ecuador has, has really developed over the last few years to become a multifaceted and multidisciplinary type of project where we're increasingly incorporating um, you know, research collaborations with people from a wide range of, of disciplines, including, um, you know, public health and, and other areas. And 
I'm very open to uh, my hope. In fact, one of the things that really excited me about the scholar in residence position at offered by Center for Public Service is the opportunity to um, use the, the community engaged research program that we have down in Ecuador as a venue to um, encourage more collaborative research and, and other perspectives on community engagement. So I welcome you guys to, um, you know, to think about if, if there's ways that, if it seems like it, it's something that might be of interest or possible, both for, um, you know, educational opportunities for students like study abroad type courses, as well as, um, you know, student research, as well as, you know, more formal research. That's something that I'm really excited and, and motivated about. So that's kind of a brief overview of, of where I'm coming from. Um, maybe I can just pause for a minute there and, and get some feedback from you guys about what what themes, are there any themes that were raised there that really stuck with you guys? What are the things that you guys wanna talk about in this session? Because we can also have a much more sort of nuts and bolts conversation about grant writing. It's gonna be challenging for me to, you know, suggest particular funding sources in your particular disciplines, because I don't have that expertise. But something that I talked about with Miriam is um, using this as a jumping off point to come up with, you know, we can, we'll make time for sure to have some conversation around that and to potentially create kind of like a living resource that'll be growing from CPS that will, you know, have information about these funding sources. Um, so that's something we can definitely talk about, but my you know, that's going to be more of sort of a joint endeavor rather than rather than something that's going to come from me. So I'm just curious, what are the what are some of the themes that you guys would like to focus on here? Please, Paul. Uh, you know, the point you raised about uh, synchrony between scholarship and and uh, meeting needs of community partners, I think is an incredibly important one. And I would I would want to suggest that that maybe if they can convince you to have another workshop that you have one dedicated just to that topic, because I think there are a number of people um, who would benefit from that and that's really necessary to to kind of work out that problem of synchronizing those in order to get more uh, uh, scholars involved in community engaged research so you know I'd be happy to talk about that I think it's really at the crux of, of moving forward in uh, uh, you know, promoting community engaged research. But I don't know about the others in this particular group, if that's you know, in, their, in their best interest right now. So I, I just think, I'd just like to say, I think that's, I agree with you. That's an incredibly important point. It's something I, I think about often. Um, and as far as the grant writing part of it, um, I would like to, to talk to or have some conversation about especially about, um, and maybe it's, it's related to your point, is uh, grants that both serve uh, the community partners and their needs, but, but also can in some way um, support the researchers and, and, the, you know, resor and provide the resources necessary to conduct the research, the scholarly research, as well as support the community partners. And so far I found most agencies, and, and maybe I'm just not looking in the right place, but they seem to, uh, their agenda seems to be to either support, you know, the, the, the nonprofit or the community partner, or they're more interested in the scholarly research into mechanisms or things like that. So that's one topic I'd, I'd like to explore if others are interested. Thank you, Paul. I guess one um, of the barriers that I've had to looking at our writing grants is, is kind of, as you said, actually kind of conceptualizing or having a model of writing that can really say, or I guess connect what I get the higher ups would see as two disparate topics, I guess, and in, in my um, specific example, I've been reading a lot about variation in um, the immune system across different um, animal taxa. 
but it's really hard for me to say, look, there's something going on in why these invasive species or these groups of birds have evolutionary variation in their immune system, this is going to help support public health measures or predict where disease spillover might happen. And because um, I don't think a lot of people think about it that way. So how does that bleed through in the Anybody else? Um, so much for this opportunity. Um, coming back to what you, were, you guys were saying about the synergy um, between scholarship and um, community engaged research, because my prior experience um, at public health, or even um, prior to joining the team there, um, there was this disconnect. You know, not to you know say that it can't be done, but I have in the work that I've done, I found that you have to have a passion for wanting to do community engaged research, or you have to at the heart of doing research here even in the city is understanding the culture of community engaged research. What does the community say? What does public health professionals or researchers say about that? And how do you mirror that together in, when you're getting ready to write the, submit the grants or even backing it up when you're thinking of that concept or do you have community residents at the table with you? So in, in some of this work that I've been able to do and even carrying to the School of um, Medicine where I'm at now, I find that um, in sharing it with my um, director is just saying, okay, how do we incorporate the voice of the community in our grant writer and, and even when we're disseminating it back to the community, all of that matters from the language we use, how we present it to the community from the publications, all of that matters that we make sure that we include the community's voice in that, but we find a way to where we're meeting our grant, our funders, um, we're, we're able to you know, we know we have these deliverables, but the same sense that we're not losing the voice of the community. So I, I love how you say you speak about the challenges as well with that perspective. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you guys. Those are all, um, you know, really good and layered you know, sorts of questions and, and comments. I mean, I think that I'm going to try to answer all, all of those questions at the same time, I think, by, by saying that, you know, when, when I started doing community engaged research, you know, kind of to Ace's point, I think like in, in a number of cases, the, the actual scholarship that you're doing, you know, it may or may not be one and the same in, as the actual interaction and, and impact that you're having with the community. The, in some cases, you know, particularly, I think if you're working in, you know, public health, or, or medicine or you know, sociology or social sciences, there, there really can be that sort of um, direct integration. It, it lends itself to that, you know, where you, know, you, can, you can sort of study and, and, and make scholarship out of the actual act and process of doing the, the engagement. But there's many fields in which that's not the case. You know, if you're doing particle physics, it's pretty hard to, to make that connection. Um, so, you know, in my own experience, like what early on in my trajectory, it was definitely, for most of my trajectory, it's been the case that like my scholarship has been one thing <clears throat> and the scholarship has really been sort of like a means to an end to have a positive impact on the community, but they haven't been one and the same. The, the scholarship has been a vehicle for me to have the positive community impact. Um, so like I do work, you know, like most of my work has been on, you know, ecology and birds and plants. And, you know, I do ask questions, I ask questions about, okay, how do the human activities like cutting down the forest affect these, these ecological endpoints? But what I did for much of my career is that I used that research and the actual, just the act of doing the research to, to provide you know, employment and alternative incomes to employ, to provide you know, uh, training and capacity building 
and you know written into the grants that I would do for the research you know so I could I could write a grant to a source like the National Science Foundation that really only cares at least you know officially they care primarily about you know if it's going to advance our understanding of ecology but in order to do the e ecological work I can get budget and money for you know salaries for people to do you know who are doing the work the the researchers and um, who are local residents. And then also, you know, as you guys are well aware, a lot of federal sources, including National Science Foundation, have, you know, broader impacts um, where they are focusing specif specifically on, you know, societal outcomes that, you know, needs to be linked somehow to science and, uh, and the work that you're doing. But, um, you know, I was able to use that to get funding for things like, um, uh, you know, education and, and going to the schools for education or, you know, gender equity type programs or, you know, things like that. So that was one, that was my model for a long time. And then at the same time under that model, I was able to also access funding from, you know, mainly foundations, foundational sources that they don't really care at all about, you know, whether you're advancing basic science. What they care about is, you know, either in my case, you know, charismatic endangered species of animals or, you know, the, the people, the communities. So, you know, in the, in the, in the model that I developed, I, I could also go to those sources and I could say, you know, here's these people that are, you know, marginalized economically and, and socially and, and they're, and if you give me this money, I'll be able to provide them with full-time employment and training that's going to make them, you know, more competitive for, um, you know, other jobs or going on to get a university degree or, you know, helping with their education, et cetera. So these sort of societal benefits um, that, that, that also actually ended up contributing to my scholarship in the sense that the job that I was creating for these people was to do the scholarship and also be, you know, sort of a conservation advocate. So there was that really that sort of circularity where I could draw from those two different funding sources. And, and that was, you know, I mean, I've been able to keep this project going for almost 20 years now with full-time staff. Some of them have worked full-time that whole period and being able to turn to those two different funding sources has been absolutely fundamental. Um, Jordan, if I if I may interrupt you briefly, yeah. um, not to go into uh, funding sources that specifically applied for your projects, but how do you do the research to find funding sources? Uh, well, I where do you start from? Yeah, when I go, I mean, a lot of different ways. I spent, you know, a lot of different places, but when I go to a conference and somebody gives every talk that I go to, I'm all, like, I will perk up no matter how boring the talk was at the, in the acknowledgement slide. And I'm, you know, who funded that? Um, when paper, you know, papers and reports, whenever funding sources are listed, you know, looking at people's websites, there's repositories of funding sources that are out there, um, word of mouth, at, you know, asking current funding sources for other ones that um, that would be relevant. Those are the main, you know, those I would say are the main strategies that I've used to identify funding sources. Um, so I I want to talk more about the actual relation, you know, the the grants per se, but I, I do want to just kind of continue this stream that I'm talking about because. Um, two things that have happened in my own trajectory that in, in the recently, like in the past three or four years, but that I think are relevant are one, we opened up two additional funding streams um, for the community engaged work that we do. The first is that we invested in, um, in building a field station that charges people when they come to the station. So, you know, if, if people are bringing a study abroad course or they're bringing, they're coming to do research or whatever, like they come and they stay at the station and they, you know, they pay a fee that 
provides, um, uh, at least when you know travel resumes, will provide you know a steady and predictable source of income that doesn't depend on the vicissitudes of of grant cycles and grant writing and stuff like that. So, you know, if you if you have a relationship with a particular community, and you see it as a long term relationship, I mean, trying to think about those those alternative sources of income that can provide a steady stream for the community so that they're not essentially dependent on you for grant writing is is an important one and then you know hand in hand with that i've also really worked to build the um, grant writing capacity of the ecuadorians that i work with and you know for some of the people i work with like people who essentially have like a second grade education like they're not going to be writing grants to the National Science Foundation that are going to get funded. But, you know, there's other people that I've worked with over time, we've grown to include not just people that are specifically from this community, but also Ecuadorians that are, um, you know, they have undergraduate degrees, in some cases, they have master's degrees. And they, you know, I've taught them over the course of time to write grant proposals, and it's taken time. But now they're getting grant proposals. I mean, they can do it from top to bottom and bring in, you know, one, one person I work with brought in, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars last year in grant proposals in, in the writing that she did. So it, you know, I mean, it goes back to, you know, another sort of fundamental precept of successful community engagement work is that it takes, you know, it's built on relationships and it takes a lot of time, you know? So, I mean, in my own case, like I'm committed to working with these communities and in this place, you know, for the duration of my career. And that's made it easy to, you know, think about, okay, it might take five years to achieve this or three years, but it's, it's a good investment in the long run. Um, and then the other thing is donors, individual private donors, um, which is, a, can be a challenging thing to do. And it can be very frustrating to work within the Tulane development office, but, you know, both within, or advancement as it's called now, but both within Tulane and also just you know, connections that you may have or may be able to develop. That's been another source that we've been able to develop. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to say. And then the, the last thing that I wanted to say, and then I'll, we can switch gears a little bit or open it up for a discussion is that um, in, in my own trajectory, like I was talking before about, you know, the scholarship that I was doing was not really, didn't really have anything to do about the scholarship of community engagement per se. It was, it was a vehicle to, to achieve positive outcomes for the community. But over time, as this project has deepened, I've gotten to a place where really the scholarship that I'm trying to do right now is one in the same as the community engagement. And the way that I've done that is by, you know, again, over time, like, developing a, a place that a space where I can collaborate with people who have the expertise needed to do that work. And in my particular context, what it's really about is like, what are the factors that affect how these local residents are managing their natural resources? Like, why is it that one family decides to cut down all their forests to put in cattle while the other family, while the neighboring property, you know, remains 50%, retains 50% of their forest and grows cacao or, or coffee on the other farm, you know, understanding the, you know, cultural, social, economic, gender types of, of um, factors that influence those decisions. And then asking, so that's totally outside. I don't know anything about how to do that work, you know, but it's it's outside of my wheelhouse. But what I do know is to ask questions about how does that affect the natural system? And then that leads to another natural question, which is how is it that these changes in the natural system are affecting, you know, health and nutrition and, you know, economic and, you know, sort of happiness. Um, well-being indices for these same families. So really understanding those dynamics is what I'm interested in. And I've formed, you know, collaborations with anthropologists and social scientists and people in public health. I'm actively trying to do that to take this sort of integrated approach. And in that perspective, 
you know, like the the public the the initiatives that we're doing around community engagement are almost like little mini experiments within that. Like we can quantify what the impact of a particular initiative is by having before and after, um, you know, types of, of responses. So that's kind of where I see, in, you know, in, to Paul's question about the integration piece, you know, that's, I don't think you need to have the two be one and the same. I think you can be, you know, publishing papers that really have nothing to do about the community engagement as long as the scholarship is um, is is somehow. I mean, the the trick there, the crux is that the scholarship itself, the act of doing the scholarship, needs to somehow, I think, you know, transmit the positive impact to the community even if the scholarship has nothing to do about what you're actually doing in the community. But in my own case, you know, it's been, it's, I think just because of the particulars where I'm working, it's been moving towards that sort of um, merger. You know. So I don't know, that was, that was a lot of me talking there. And I think I tried to answer all those, all those questions in, in that, uh, in that little spiel. So I don't know, maybe we can have a little bit of conversation about that and then we don't have a ton of time left. So then maybe we can switch gears to talk a little bit more about the mechanics of grant writing um, and finding sources or, does that make sense? Comments, questions? It sounds good. Any other feedback? Okay, so let's switch gears and talk a little bit about um, about. So I guess we could talk about in terms of the actual mechanics. I mean, the things that I talk that I was thinking about were, um, you know, I can think about talking about identifying funding sources. We talked about that a little bit already, so I don't really know how much more I need to say about that. But we could. One thing that Miriam and I had envisioned was having a, you know, providing a space for there to be some back and forth about that. But it seems if we're gonna finish in 15 or 20 minutes, we might be short on time for that. What actually um, I'm gonna do, and Caitlin who joined us, who's a graduate assistant to um, my colleague Bridget, is putting together a survey um, that I'll send out after the event. Um, and you're welcome to share some of your strategies and, and sources that you've used before or tips on the grant writing process. But I'm gonna send out that information, uh, that survey for you to fill out. And it'll be uh, a, a repos repository of resources that we can share amongst people who attended today. But also uh, my idea is to have it live on one of the CPS um, resource hubs so that other faculty and students can consult that at any time and it can grow over time. Great, I think that's gonna be a hugely helpful resource. Um, so maybe we can I'll talk a little bit about relationships with funding sources and then we can talk about, I don't know if it would be helpful to talk about actually you know, drilling down a little bit into the mechanics and strategies about the grant writing, which in some ways is gonna depend on the funding source and what their priorities are and what the format is and stuff. But in, in broad stroke terms, we talked a little bit about, you know, different strategies to find funding sources. You know, I definitely recommend like having a, it's really hard to have a, an up-to-date document about funding sources because they just, you know, their websites change, the, there's, you know, sort of like uh, priorities or that shift. There's, you know, different funding sources that blink on and off. So it's really hard, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, it's work to maintain kind of like an up-to-date um, document. But at the same time, it makes sense to at least have like, you know, some kind of Excel spreadsheet is what I have where you just have like the list of the potential funding sources and every once in a while you can kind of circle back around and just see well, what's going on with that with those guys you know can i ask a question about that yeah have you ever i guess had a 
grant accepted to a funding source where you're kind of surprised or like had it, I guess, rejected in a way. And I guess like what I'm thinking is, is if, if you have what you think is a really disciplinary idea um, and then like trying to uh, send that grant towards the funding source, did, has anything happened in your experience where you're like, wow, I can't believe that got accepted or wow, I really don't understand why they didn't accept that. Yeah, especially the latter. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I'm friendly with a program officer at the NSF and he was telling me about a, a study that the NSF commissioned, um, you know, which, so they receive, um, you know, National Science Foundation, they receive, you know, who knows how many tens of thousands of proposals each year. So it's a big data set. And, you know, ask questions about, okay, what are the predictors of funding success? Is it, is it, is it geography? Is it gender? Is it career stage? Is it past publication record? You know what, I mean, they put in like a ton of different variables and there was really only one thing that predicted um, success and that's the number of times that people applied. You know, it's, it's really, really hard to predict what is gonna get funded and what's not gonna get funded. And I mean, there's been proposals that I've been frankly em embarrassed to send out that have gotten funded. And then there's been proposals that I thought were like the best thing that I had ever done in my life that I was sure were going to get funded and didn't get funded. So it's really, it's really hard to know. And it depends on, I mean, there's so many different things that are really difficult to predict that it depends on, especially when you're going to a funding source that's unknown. So my, I mean, one main prediction would be, you know, just apply as much as you can, as broadly as you can. And then two, a few different things that I do that I recommend is one, um, if you don't get funded, write them an email and ask if you, unless you get really good feedback, write them an email and ask why you didn't get funded. And, and the way that I do it is I say, you know, um, you know, I, I totally understand, you know, you try, I mean, try not to be bitchy about it. Like, you know, don't be like, I can't believe you find me, but be like, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you had a lot of great proposals and I totally understand, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to come back to you guys again in the future. And it would be really helpful for me to know, am I in the ballpark? You know, is this, and, and most of the time they'll write back to you and, and let you know oh, you know, you were really close. Or you know what, we don't care at all about what you're looking at, you were off base. So, I mean, that's one thing I, I really recommend doing. And then sort of combined with that, another thing that I try to do is to develop a relationship as much as possible, or at least who they know who I am, you know? Like, so that's one way you can start it. Or another way is, I'll sometimes like come up with a question to write them that is not, I mean, maybe like I, I don't even really need to know the answer to it, but I'll write them an email about it. I'll be like, hey, you know, I'm applying to this grant and, um, you know, here's a question that I had. I mean, not, try not to make it be one where the answer is really obvious, but something that just like establishes a little bit of communication and then they write back to you and they'll say, oh, you, you know, here's the answer to that question. And you can say, oh, thanks so much. You know, I'm really interested in, and and what, and sometimes it just stops there. And most of the time, those people are just not just, but those people that you're interacting with, they're not the people that are going to make the decision. They're they're administrators who are, you know, gatekeepers and handling the paperwork basically. But those same people um, can really end up giving you some really important information <laughs> sometimes in terms of of the funding like like i've had people that have written back to me and said things like um you know just out of the blue like you know this you know this one you know this one that you're applying to is 10 times more competitive than this other program within our foundation you know so you know things like that that have been that sometimes it's not every day that that happens you know but it's i think it does help to be to 
kind of like be a known quality quantity for these people, i.e. someone that they at least recognize the name and institution and then to, you know, as much as possible, develop a relationship with them. Um, so that because I, I think it does, you know, it's been helpful for me to have that. And that's, you know, that's and, and I'm being clear to say that it's it's not just the, you know, the director of the foundation or, or the, the program officer of the agency, although those are also really important relationships, but it's, it, it can also just be, you know, the people that are, are sort of the, the gatekeepers and the administrators. I'm sorry, I have another question. Um, actually, I would like to ask for your input. So I found myself walking between the line between, between the academic uh, grant proposal as well as the private sector nonprofit proposal, I found that um, majority of my academic proposal get uh, funded, um, but it's kind of harder for the nonprofit sector to get funded uh, with uh, some the type of um, similar, similar grants. So do you think the relationship uh, between the organization that you have would affect the chance of getting uh, funded for the grant? Because uh, when I when I wrote the grant proposal, I was actually with the uh, Emory University. So all the grants that I, uh, that I got funded, it's 100% it's got funded for all of them. But when I wrote a grant uh, based on my, uh, the foundation, we pretty much, um, have less chances because of most of the grants that got funded, they already have like a strong relationship with the grantors. So I would like to ask for your input. Do you think that factor would play into your opportunity of getting funded? You know? Yeah, I mean, I do think that, that I mean, the funding sources, I think, you know, a useful way to think about it that I think about it sometimes is as an investment. Like, like the same, I mean, it's, I think the same principles apply as someone on Wall Street who's thinking about what this, what company to invest in. I mean, they have, uh, they have something that they want to see happen. They have their mission, you know, and they have a certain amount of money and their job is to maximize the impact with the money that they have, right? I mean, so, so certainly, you know, if there's a known quantity, I mean, the same way that you as an investor, if you have something that's a question mark and something that's a known quantity, you know, you might want to invest in the known quantity um, because you know that they can deliver the results, you know, based on their past performance. So it's, it, it can be really hard to, like I've, I've benefited from that. Like I have one funding source, um, the Disney Foundation that has funded us continuously from 2002 to the present, every year. And it's not a huge grant, but they've you know, consistently funded us every year. And that's been huge for us in terms of you know, maintaining that continuity. But then there's other sources that you know, I can see they keep funding the same people and I'm like, oh, you know, I don't think so. <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, I think that when you, when you look at foundational funding sources, I think that an, another sort of thing that I try to do is to, is to really read carefully their, their mission statement and their RFP, the request for proposals, you know, and and take like words and phrases from that and put it in your proposal, you know, so that you're actually like repeating to them like exactly the same things that they're saying that they care about. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't know, I mean, it's hard for me to know without the specifics, but I think that um, those, those, I don't know. I mean, that might have some impact. It's, I don't know the answer to your question is, is a shorter way of, of saying. <laughs> saying that. Thank you. Along the lines um, of like taking the language um, RFP and putting it in the proposal, I'm curious. I'm, I'm not 
not sure, Amanda, I'm not sure if um, you're coming out clear to everyone. Yeah, I'm having a hard but, time hearing. Yeah. Um, you can try again or maybe write in the chat box. And in the meantime, does anybody want to jump in with another question? I would like to comment um, that, uh, especially for people who are just starting out with grant writing, I've, I've found, and I don't know if Jordan agrees with me, but I've found that uh, federal agencies provide a lot more uh, feedback. And um, so you get a lot of information from the reviewers about um, you know, criticisms and, and what they found lacking or shortcomings. Uh, whereas with private foundations, at least in my experience, uh, rarely do you get that kind of feedback. So I, I, I appreciate your point of, of following up and trying to establish relationships or trying to solicit feedback from them. But, um, you know, maybe if you can send a, a form of the same idea to both the federal agency as well as private foundations, you can then um, you know, at least get from the federal agency some uh, very detailed uh, criticism from experts in your field, which I find to be really valuable, uh, that kind of criticism. Yeah, that's a great point, Paul. I mean, I think that, you know, there's two, I think, uh, important sort of, you know, perspective on this is that there's two different ways, at least, there's probably a million different ways, but there's, I'm thinking of two different ways that a proposal can fail to get funded. One is because the, the subject matter just doesn't fit with what they wanna fund. So, I mean, you could do the best job in the world of doing it, but the thing that you're trying to do, they don't, is not a priority. And, and then the other is, you know, you're saying some, you're, you're doing something that they're interested in, but you're just not, you know, they're not convinced about, you know, your methodology and how well you're going to do it. And I think that in my own experience, being off target is, it's much more common in the foundation world. It's, it's much less clear what it is that they want a lot of times. And I suspect sometimes they don't even know necessarily, you know, what they want. But I, my sense is that foundations in general the reason that, that proposals fail with them more is just because it doesn't hit their target. And I think they almost, a lot of times, I think foundations, the review boards that they have, it varies. And there's some that are definitely not like this, but there's a lot of foundations that they lack, they don't have the expertise to, to really dig into the nuts and bolts. You know, is this statistical test better than that statistical test? Or is this lab method better than that one? They don't know. They're just sort of assuming if you're coming from a research institution or you know if you have the right credentials that it's it's going to be that's going to work and they care more about whereas like federal sources i feel like it's you know usually like you're doing something that they care about because they're very explicit and clear about what it is that they care about and it's much more sort of like you know the impact that that that, that work is going to have and then and then the methods Okay, I'll read out loud Amanda's question. It says, has using language from applying to interests of RFP ever taken your research in a direction based on funders, not on your own communities that you've had to grapple with ethically? If so, what's an example? And ooh, good question. Let's see. If so, what's an example and how did you reconcile? So, I mean, I think as a, as a faculty member, this is some, and, and I think also actually for everybody in this conversation, this is an issue, you know, when you see funding that you feel like you can get, but it's not really what you feel like you want or should be doing, should you apply for that money? And um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely been the case for me. There's definitely been times that I've gone after funding um, and been, you know, sort of lukewarm about actually implementing the project. And in some cases it's, and then sometimes I've gotten the funding. Um, and 
I have done, you know, it, it depends. I mean, when there's been, when it gets to the actual implementation stage, if there's like a real trade-off between what we're doing already and then what this grant is calling for us to do, um, I have never returned the money, um, but I, I, there's times when, you know, we've done like the very bare minimum on those proposals. That to be honest, I mean, it's, we've done sort of a half-ass job on some proposals. And the reason why is in my particular situation in Ecuador, you know, we cobble together these different proposals that sometimes are really quite small into larger projects that enable us to do, you know, larger scale, larger scale projects. But when, so like, for example, if we have like, you know, five different proposals that are all towards monitoring this one bird. And then we get this one proposal that's like an outlier that's that's um, based on, if I may, that's based on, you know, looking at a monkey or a frog or something like that. To really, to really do that project well, we would need to have more resources to be able to, to really implement it. You know, it's put us in, We've never, you know, fallen afoul of a funding source. We've always done enough to tick the boxes, you know, without without having to, you know, fabricate or do anything unethically. But there's definitely been times when we have not done a great job on projects. Jordan, I see the clock is ticking. So to respect uh, people's time, um, we're going to have to adjourn. Um, unless you want to say, you know, wrap it up or. Yeah, well, th thank you, Marion. Yeah, I'll just say thank you guys very much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I wish we were meeting in person so we could all get to know each other in that context as well. Um, in the spring, I'll, I'd, I'd love to give another, I've talked with Miriam, I think about giving another workshop. And I think Paul, your suggestion is, is spot on. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Absolutely. That. Thank you all for coming. I really welcome you guys to reach out to me on an individual level. Um, my email is jk at tulane.edu and I would be happy to, you know, provide feedback, either specific or more general. Um, so let's do that. And thanks, Mary. Yeah, uh, look for an email from me with uh, that survey and I'll copy Jordan so you, you'll have his email there as well. Um, and if you have any questions uh, concerning community engaged research or you know want have suggestions, um, uh, want resources, etc., cetera, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And meanwhile, thank you all to, for being here and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Jordan. That was right. wonderful. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Appreciate you guys. Mm -hmm.